Numbers. We live by numbers. We track and count and measure everything. And sometimes we think the only numbers that really matter are the big ones. But it's the single digits that make the difference. The Bible says that heaven rejoices with the number one. Yeah, heaven rejoices each time even one person comes to know Jesus. We pastors dream about big numbers, and we should. But a daily focus on one meaningful interaction for Christ, that's the true difference maker. One friend, one family member, one co-worker, one person at a time. We want to see God move in our nation like we have never seen before. But it all starts with one. I've got my one. And now I'm challenging you and your church to join us and to find yours. Because ultimately, the only number that really matters is one. Who's your one? I mean, I want to celebrate before I begin, media team in the back, before we begin, I want to celebrate just this time of worship. During the worship hour right here, we just had one um, born again right now during the worship time. So, amen, let's just celebrate that for just a moment. Can we just, can we just celebrate that for just a moment? Amen. Amen. I love it when they come over and say, Pastor, this one just got saved. Amen. It doesn't get any better than that. And so I'm going to try to gather my thoughts this morning, and uh, man, what excitement that we have here today in God's house. We're honored that you are here. We're honored that you're here. And I want to share a little something with you this morning as we begin. You ready? Three billion. Three billion. That's how many people in the world there are who are unreached with the gospel. There's 168,911. That's how many people are unchurched and within reach of this ministry. Many of these people have not accepted Jesus Christ as Lord, they've not accepted the good news, the gospel. And these numbers may seem overwhelming to you, but there's another number that matters. It's the number one. That means we serve a God who cares about the one. We know that because Jesus spoke with one woman at the well. He called one tax collector down from the tree. He met one Pharisee on the road to Damascus. He raised one man from the grave. He's the good shepherd who leaves the 90 and 9 to reach one. And as Christians, we are called to do the very same thing. You don't have to reach everyone. Instead, we are challenging you to pray and share the gospel with just one. One person you know. Because all of heaven rejoices when just one sinner repents. If we want to be a catalyst for a spiritual awakening here in Harrelson County and beyond, it starts with one. Who's your one? I want you to think about that this morning. Those are significant numbers that you've just heard. Those are numbers that some of you may think are unrealistic. Numbers that seem impossible. But I want to say to you this morning, who's your one is all about identifying a person that needs Jesus Christ, a lost person, identifying that person, praying for that person, and engaging that person with the gospel. I read this week where 20% of believers will invite another believer to church. They're willing to invite another believer to church. So I want you to think about that. 20%, only one in five of you will invite another believer to church. But then listen to this number. 
only 2% of believers, Christ followers, people who just saying thank you, Jesus, for the blood. Only 2% of those people will ever invite an unchurched or unsaved person to church. Now, 2%, think about that. Only 2% of believers, Christ followers, will ever invite an unchurched or an unsaved person to church. What does that say about where we are? Only one out of five? That means that 98% of us, 98% of us will never invite a lost person to church. How many lost people did you bring with you today? I think we've got maybe 2%, maybe, hopefully. But let that resonate in your heart this morning. Lifeway did a study, a research study, and they asked how many times they have personally invited an unchurched person to attend a church service or to attend some other church program. L- listen, to what, listen to what these numbers came back as. 48% of church attendees responded they have never invited anybody, zero, to church. 33% of people say they've personally invited someone once or twice. 19% say they've done so on three or more occasions in the last six months. And the same study revealed this. 21% of churchgoers say that outside of church worship services, they pray every day for people they know who are not professing Christians. 26% of, of believers say they pray a few times a week. 20% say that they rarely pray or never pray for the spiritual status of anybody. Which one of these columns would you find yourself in? According to Ed Stetzer, he's the president of Lifeway Research, he said this, praying more frequently for the status of people who are not professing Christians is the best indicator of more spiritual maturity in the entire sharing Christ factor. If you're going to be intentional about sharing your faith, praying for others is a great way to start. We often acknowledge the importance of prayer and people coming to faith in Christ, but we also found it has an impact on the person who's praying. You want to know how to grow and and become more spiritually mature? Start praying for somebody who needs Jesus. What a great step toward your spiritual maturity. So you're hearing these stats this morning, and, and I just want you, for the last few weeks, we've gone through our core values We've talked about those core values, and I've asked you questions. I've asked you questions. We've put things on the screen like a a Chick-fil-A symbol or logo, and I would say, what do you think about when you see Chick-fil-A, or what do you think about whenever you see Apple or Google? What What do you think about when you see the Refuge logo? What comes to mind? And so because you're so used to that, we've been doing that for the last few weeks, I want to just kind of... Play the name game again with you, right, for just a moment, right? What's the first thing that comes to your mind when when I say the word Trump supporter? What's the first thing that comes to your mind when I say NASCAR? What's the first thing that you visualize when you hear those words NCAA or Go Dogs or Roll Tide or... comes to mind what about let's take it a little further what what about when i say star wars do do you think about that new era is that what pops in your mind or are you like me and you think about the good stuff the old stuff right what comes to your mind when you hear that word what pops into your mind now now here's the big question this morning what comes to mind when you hear this word christian What do you think about when you hear the word Christian? I'm certain that in this room, there would be so many different definitions of the word Christian. 
and how many people would describe a, a, a Christian. Maybe somebody would say, well, Christians describe a church. And if you ask ten different people, I bet you're going to get at least nine different answers. What do you think of when you, you hear the word Christian? And I believe if you stop people on the street and you were to ask them this question, are you a Christian? Are you a Christian? I think you're going to get some people who are going to say, well, well yes, I, I, am, I am a Christian. Some are going to say, what, what do you mean? Some are going to say, yeah, but... Um, Some are going to say, no, I'm not, but um, some are going to say, yeah, I'm a Christian, but I'm not like. It's going to be a lot of different descriptions when asked, are you a Christian or what is a Christian? Some of you are going to say that at some point you became a Christian, right? If that's how, how some of you... Um, would answer, you might say, well, there was a point in my life where I, I prayed a prayer, I walked an aisle, I got baptized, I, maybe I went to a confirmation class, I went to a 101 class or, or a next step class, and maybe that was the traditions that you've come from, from, from wherever you were as a child, or maybe even now. Others would say, you know, I've just always been a Christian. Since I've been born, I've been a Christian. But there's some of you in the room right now and possibly somebody that's going to watch this message online or even watching right now. And, and they're not going to say what you said. They're going to say this. No, I'm definitely not a Christian. I'm definitely not a Christian. And if you were asked to define what comes to mind, that, that person might have a little different definition for a Christian. They, they may say something like this. Christians are judgmental, homophobic, moralists who think that they're, they're the only ones who are going to heaven and they secretly relish the fact that everybody else is going to hell. There may be somebody in the room thinking that right now. Here's the strange very strange and interesting fact. The first followers of Christ didn't call themselves Christians. They didn't call themselves Christians. That, that was not a name that they chose for themselves. Maybe you're going to learn something this morning, but the name Christian was a derogatory statement that was given to people who chose to follow Christ. It was a derogatory term that was used by people outside of the Jewish community. Acts chapter 11 tells us it was in Antioch the disciples were first called Christians. And maybe you're, you're like me. I grew up thinking that's a great thing. In Antioch, yes, they're finally called Christians. That must be a great bunch of people over there around Antioch, right? Right? Man, they gave them a great name. But no, it was passive. It was, really, it was really something to stir them up. It was really almost like bullying. It was a derogatory term that meant like this. You're, oh, you're a little Christ, right? We got a bunch of little Jesuses running around the, around the place, right? It wasn't a positive thing. And maybe you're thinking, well, Pastor, uh, if they didn't call themselves Christians, what did, they, what did they call themselves? We're about to talk about that this morning. Because they didn't call themselves Christians. They called themselves disciples of Jesus. I, I want you to consider this this morning. Did you know that the word Christian is only used three times in the Bible? Three, three times is the word Christian used in the entire Bible. Do you know how many times the word disciple is used in your Bible? 281. So we have the word Christian that everybody refers to themselves now as, I'm a Christian. Oh, I'm a Christian. What do you think about being a Christian? We, we refer to ourselves as that, but in the Word of God, it's only mentioned three times. The word disciples mentioned 281 times in the New Testament alone. And you say, well, so what? So what, Pastor? Well, well here's what. 
Here's what Andy, Andy, Andy Stanley said this, and I'm going to agree with him. This is what he said. I want to suggest to you that in changing the primary word that we use to describe ourselves, we lost the clarity that the word disciple conveyed about what a follower of Jesus actually is. Let, let, let me say that a little, little better. One, one more time. Somebody back in the back, turn your head a little bit. Listen to me. I want to suggest to you that in changing the primary word that we use to describe ourselves, we lost the clarity that the word disciple conveyed about being a follower of Jesus. What a disciple actually is. Is. I want to show you today that, that our use of the term Christian obscures the fact that a lot of people who call themselves Christians are not disciples or followers of Christ. And I don't know if you'll agree with me or what, but the, the word disciple is so much clearer, so much more defined than the word Christian. And I want us to go back a little bit this morning and try to get into what a disciple actually was. So outside of Mr. Brandon, who was with me at the jail all day yesterday and heard this four times for four hours, I want to excuse you from tuning into this, brother, but everybody else needs to tune in. All the Hebrew boys, when they were five years old, they, they went to what they called Torah school. And Torah school was all about learning the first five books of the Bible, right? The first five books of the Old Testament, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. They started at age five, and it started with a ceremony where they would bring those five-year-old boys in. They would take a drop of honey, and they would put it on their tongue. And now, for the most part, these boys were poor. They didn't have a lot, so they were poor. And they put that, that honey on their tongue, and it would be the first time that they ever tasted any kind of sweetness just like this. And so, this sweet sensation, it flooded their senses for the very first time. And while this, they, they were having these sensations, they were reading to them God's Word. And what they, were, what they were doing in this moment, the image is this, that the Word of God is going to be sweet to you. It's going to be powerful for you, powerful for you. And for the next five years, they would memorize large sections of the Torah. Well, by age 10, they started doing some weeding out. Right? They only took the very best students, maybe the upper 20% or so. And, and that 20%, that upper 20% would move on and they would go a little deeper, but the rest of them went home to their fathers. Guess what they went and did? They went and got a J-O-B. Right? Maybe they went back and, and, and they were working with the family businesses or whatever, but the boys who remained in the Torah school would study on until about age 17 where they would learn the rest of what we call the Old Testament, Joshua through Malachi. And so they would learn for the next seven years. Well, when they got to age 17, there was another cut. There was another cut. If you wanted to go further with your religious studies after that, you had to find yourself a rabbi. And when you reach out to that rabbi now, it had to be, it was a rabbi maybe that you admire, admired and, and you had to apply to, to become that, rab, that rabbi's Talmud or that rabbi's disciple. Now rabbi just means, rabbi just means teacher, right? And Talmud just means disciple, just to clear that up. It's the Hebrew word for disciple. And so when you found your rabbi, you would go and you would sit at his feet, and while you were sitting at your feet, that, that was your request to learn from that rabbi. And that rabbi would examine that student through a series of questions and, and through a series of tests to see whether or not they were worthy to be their disciple. And you see, those rabbis were really able to be selective because in those days, becoming a religious ruler was the best of all possible jobs. 
So almost every Hebrew boy dreamed of becoming a religious expert one day. They didn't dream about becoming basketball players or rock stars because they didn't have them back then. They dreamed of becoming religious experts. So therefore the rabbis could choose only the smartest, most talented boys to be their disciples. And another reason the rabbis were so picky is that when they chose a disciple, they were choosing somebody that they believed had the capacity to become just like them. To be able to do exactly what they were doing. Not just to know that they, they knew and to hear, they, they knew their teacher and to hear their teacher, but to do what their teacher did. There was a very selective process that these rabbi would make. They wanted what they did to carry on. And for several years, these disciples would follow their rabbis around, imitating them in every way. They would learn their mannerisms. They would learn how they answered certain questions. They would learn how to respond in situations. And, and supposedly, the highest compliment you could pay a disciple in those days was to say to them, the dust of your rabbi is all over you. And what that would, would, would mean is, is simply this. That was saying that wherever and whatever your rabbi stepped in, it sprayed up on you. That's how close you followed him. Everything that your rabbi does, you do. You got covered with it. And I read an article that, that John MacArthur put out, and he, he said it this way. In choosing his disciples, Jesus skipped all the wise of the day. The great scholars were in Egypt. The great library was in Alexandria. The great philosophers were in Athens. The powerful were in Rome. He passed over Herodias, the historian, and Socrates, the great thinker. Julius Caesar, the great ruler. And he chose men to be his disciples so ordinary that it was comical. Not a single rabbi, no teachers, no religious experts, not even a synagogue ruler. Half of them were fishermen. One was essentially an IRS agent, and one of them was a former terrorist. He chose a B team because his work in the world would not come from their abilities. It would come from what Jesus Christ would do through them. See, people with a lot of talent and ability sometimes get in the way of what God wants to do. Jesus taught that his power in the weakest vessel was infinitely greater than the greatest talent apart from him. I want to I want to just just before we dive into this message anymore. I know it's a lot of intro for you this morning to take in. But I want to I want to read to you Matthew 11 verse 9. It, it says this, truly I tell you among those born of women there has not risen anyone greater than John the Baptist. Yet whoever is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. Now 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 listen to this. Jesus is talking to his disciples, right? And he says, of all those ever born to women, which means everybody, that means you, the one who is greatest in the world, according to Jesus, the greatest preacher ever to live, according to Jesus, was John the Baptist. That's what he said. John the Baptist was Jesus' favorite all-time preacher. The, and look at what he says. The one who is least in my kingdom is greater than John the Baptist. I, I mean, I want you to think about for that for just a moment. Think about the impact of what he just said. Now, I'm going to be kind of funny right here for just a moment to reiterate a point, but just bear with me. Least of the kingdom of heaven means that you know the least about the Bible. It means that you have the least amount of talent. It means that you are the least eloquent. It means you have the least amount of spiritual gifts. Here's the, here's the reality right here. Somebody in this room today... Somebody in this room today is the least in the kingdom of God. One of you in here is going to qualify for being the least. And that's not to make fun or that's not to be mean, but mathematically it has to be true. One of you in the room has the least amount of talent. One of you in the room is the least capable. You're the least eloquent. You know the least about the Bible. And somebody's saying, that's me, Pastor. I don't know nothing about nothing. 
Maybe somebody's in here thinking, man, Pastor John's talking right about me, right? Well, if you're thinking I'm talking about you, yep, it's you. It's you. And again, I don't mean that to be mean, but I'm using that to mean to make a point right here. He didn't, he didn't choose you because you were a great dad. He didn't choose you because you were a great mom. He didn't choose you because you were a great witness. Listen, this is, he didn't choose you because you were a great preacher. He chooses people because they're willing. They're willing. You don't have to be rich and famous to be willing. And this morning as we get into this message and we kick off, who's your one? Why are you better and greater than John the Baptist? Because you've got something on the inside of you. You've got something that was promised that you could have and would have the moment you become a follower of Christ. That's the power of the Holy Spirit. It wasn't until the day of Pentecost that so many were filled with the Spirit, but you, once you are born again, you have something inside of you they didn't have. That's why Jesus was saying, even the least is greater. Only because of what's inside of you, who's inside you. I want you to turn with me in your Bibles this morning to John chapter 1. John chapter 1, verses 35 and following. All these people, 3 billion people in the world today that have not been reached with the gospel. All all these people in, in our community. I've done the research this week, and I researched Harrelson County, Polk County, Carroll County, and Cleburne County. It gave me a total of 211,000 people and some change. That's a lot of people. When you take the percentage out of those, only 20% of that number attend church. Only 20%. That leaves us with 168,000 people that are unreached by the gospel. You say, Pastor, I mean, you know, uh, we're just right here in Tallapoosa. There's not but 3,300 people, and, you know, this is really our Jerusalem, and this is really all we're supposed to really be impacting just, just right here. I don't know where you've been hiding or what head or hole you've had your head in. But 168,000 people need the gospel? Listen to me. How much you got to hate somebody not to go share it with them? To leave them where they are. Pastor, that's a huge number. That's overwhelming to me. We can't get 168,000 in here. Well, listen, you might be right. But I see enough for one, another one, another one, another one right there, and another one right there, and another one right there. There's three over here, three over there, two over there, three over there, five over there, two over there, three, six right there, and three rows in the back. What's your excuse now? We're just going to let them go? What's the reason if there's 168,000? It's not possible to reach 168,000 people from this platform with just this voice crying in the wilderness. That's why God didn't put the responsibility just on pastors or apostles or or preachers or teachers or evangelists. He didn't just put it on us. It's us. We've been commissioned. Who's your one? Last week you were challenged. To think about one person that you know needs Jesus. Write their name down on a piece of paper and put it in a basket. Bring it back today and put it on the basket. Did you even think to do that? Some are nodding yes, and some are saying, I forgot, I forgot, I forgot. Well, you know what? Just so you know, we, we got you some more sheets out there because we anticipated you forgetting. Especially when we're living in a world where 90% of people 
don't have never shared their faith, have never shared the gospel. So you've got another chance to do it today. To write that person your one. To write your one person that you really want to see come to Christ. That you're really, you're, you're really willing to. To identify, to pray for, and to engage with the gospel. That one. Not just the one you say, oh, so-and-so's lost, they're going to hell. Okay, that's your one. It's not my one, that's your one. I got my one. John chapter 1, verse 35 through 46, it says this. The next day again, John was standing with two of his disciples, and he looked at Jesus as he walked by and said, Behold, the Lamb of God. I just want to pause right there. I want you to envision this. John the Baptist is standing right here. He's the forerunner of Jesus. He's got two people on his side that are his disciples, right? They are John the Baptist's disciples. We know who they are, and I'm going to identify them to you in just a moment. But they are on each side of, of John the Baptist, and Jesus walks by out there, and this is what he's saying. He said, Behold, the Lamb of God. He didn't say it like, Hey, hey, y'all, look over there. He said, Behold. That's like saying, Hey, hey, hey. There he is. There he is right there. That's him. That's the Christ. And the moment that he said that, the moment he said that, the two disciples heard him say that, and they followed Jesus. Verse 38 says this, Then Jesus turned and saw them following to them, and this is what he said. And man, we got to answer this question this morning. What are you seeking? Just envision this. Jesus is walking. He's going, and all of a sudden, you ever get that feeling where you feel like somebody's behind you? He turns around, and he says, What are you seeking? What are you looking for? What do you want out of life? And look how they respond. They, they said to them, they, this is what they said to them, Rabbi, which means teacher. This is what they say. It's really weird. Where are you staying? Where are you stays? Hey, look, at, look, where are you staying? I'm thinking, why in the world? Lord, what's that in the Bible for? I'm going to show you in just a moment. Where are you staying? And Jesus said this, and listen to me. This is what I, I believe he's saying. I believe he's going to say this to somebody at the end of this service. He looked at those disciples and said, come and see. Why don't you come and see? Man, I thought about how this ties into our core values because Jesus was committed to excellence in everything he did. He didn't have to go back. Nobody went behind Jesus and touched anything again. When he touched it, it was excellent. Man, he had a heart for evangelism. He came to seek and save the lost. He's looking at these two disciples. He is so relational. He just invited these two people into his house. Come and see. Man, what a man of integrity. Servant attitude that he has to, to serve them. He came not to be served, but to serve. And this man, Jesus, built the greatest team. It's matchless. It's uncomparable, the team he built. There'll never be another team like the team Jesus built. They can be one close. And we can do the same things. But man, what the ability to put together some teamwork. Jesus says, come and see. So they came and saw where he was staying, and they stayed with him that day, for it was about the tenth hour. And one of the two who heard John speak and followed Jesus was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first found his own brother Simon and said to him, Look, we found the Messiah, which means Christ, and he brought him to Jesus. The next day, Jesus looked at him and said, You're Simon, the son of John. You should be called Cephas. The next day, Jesus decided to go to Galilee. He found Philip and said to him, Follow me. And Philip found Nathanael and said to him, We found him of whom Moses in the law and all the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. And Nathanael said to him, Can anything good come out of Nazareth? He's about to find out. Can anything good come out of Nazareth? And Philip said to him, Come and see. Come and see. And so this morning, I want to talk to you for just a few more minutes, and 
I want you to sh- I want to show you how important who's your one is. And, and, and this campaign that we're launching here and for, for the rest of the year and maybe all, all for an entire year. I want to say to you as we begin this, Jesus is never going to ask you to do something that he has not done himself. Say, Jesus, what do you you mean? Jesus went out. Did you catch what happened in this passage right here? I'm not going to preach on this this as a point, but I want to pull this out to you and show you. I want to show you right here. He invited two disciples into this house. I believe they got saved in that moment. I believe they encountered something. We're going to talk about what happened in that house in just a moment. But he invited two in. But when they came out of the house, Andrew went in one direction, Jesus went in another. Look at what it says. The next day, Jesus decided to go to Galilee, and Jesus found Philip. What is Jesus doing? He is modeling before those disciples what to do. He didn't say, y'all go out and get everybody saved and come back and see me. Jesus went out and found Philip. And so as you hear this this morning, Jesus is finding people. Those people are finding people. And Jesus asked the question, what are you seeking? Now, if we sang a little bit ago, but thank you, Jesus, for the blood. We sang that song, and man, it was a great time of worship, and it was powerful. And then hearing everybody back there, and that glory to his name just resonating up here to the front, man, it was powerful out here. I don't know what the praise team was hearing, but what I was hearing out here was powerful. But we're going to sing about glory to his name. We're going to sing thank you for the blood. We're going to sing those things. And Jesus has clearly shown us an example right here of what bringing glory to his name looks like. He's brought us an example right here of of how it's supposed to be modeled. Jesus is finding people that find people. That's what he's doing. And I thought to myself, what really happened in that house that day? What went on when Jesus said, come and see? The Bible said that they went to his house and and they stayed with him to about the 10th hour. And my question was, what went on in that house? And, And can I say to you this morning... Whatever went on in that house that day needs to go on in this house today. That's what needs to happen. Whatever went on in that house with with John and Andrew on that particular day needs to happen in this house at the refuge today. We need people that are going to come out of this message that have really been, that Jesus found you and now you're willing to go find somebody for him. Who's your one? Who's your one? I asked you a question a little bit ago. Why did he say, he said, what are you seeking? They asked, where are you staying? Where are you staying? And and it's seemingly seemingly out of context, but here's what I believe about where are you staying. Here's what I think. This is my opinion. You don't have to agree with it, but this is what I think. I think it indicates that John, and this is not John the Baptist, this is the Apostle John. He's not the, the Apostle John just yet, but he's about to be, right? John and Andrew, the writer of the book of John, this is who we're talking about. John and Andrew. I believe this this indicates that John and Andrew were serious followers of Christ. They were serious about being a disciple of Jesus. It indicates a commitment, not an experiment. Curiosity about Christ or or occasional spiritual interest is not enough. We got to follow Christ for the right reasons. I believe they asked him where he was staying because they were doing it for the right reason. I want to know where you live because I'm going to come over there and I want to talk because I want more. I want more of what you're doing. I want more of what you're hearing. I understand how the discipleship works. Do you realize this morning, you know why these men were fishermen? Do you realize why they were fishermen? They didn't make the cut that I talked to you about a little bit ago at the Torah school. They weren't good enough to go on in the school, so they had to go get a job, and they were second-rate people, ordinary people in that culture. But Jesus chose them. 
I believe it indicated because they understood. They understood in that culture what it, they'd done been kicked out. They understood what discipleship really is. They understood that discipleship means learner. If you're going to be a disciple, that means you are a learner. You are a learner of somebody. If you're a disciple of Jesus, that means you are a learner of Jesus. That's all that it means. And I was going for the record this morning, and I'm going to say this. In today's culture, disciple and Christian don't mean the same thing to most people. It just don't. Quite possibly to most of us in the room. I'm a Christian. I'll say I'm a Christian, and I want to wear that label for the wrong reason. We had a guy yesterday that told us in the prison this. He said this. He said, I'm not going to call myself a Christian. I'll call myself a disciple, but I'm not going to cause myself, I'm not going to call myself a Christian because there ain't much about me that even looks like Jesus. Now I'm trying to learn, and I want to learn, and I've done wrong, and I've repented, and I believe in Jesus. I've made the Lord, made him the Lord of my life, and I'm a disciple, and I'm trying, but I refuse to call myself Christian because that's a label I don't deserve to wear. But let's look how many people in the church this morning are going to bow their chest out and say, I'm a Christian and I deserve it. But I don't know anything about Jesus. I ain't learned anything from him. All you did was bought a fire insurance policy. You came down here and thought you'd pray a prayer and get a fire extinguisher that you could fight hell with, but that's not what you got. What happened in that house that day? Man, something happened. Something happened with John and Andrew. And whatever happened in that house needs to happen in this house today. I want you to see this first point right here if you're taking notes. I believe the first thing that happened is they came face to face with truth. I believe they came face to face with truth. And I'm going to say it this morning. Some of us need to come face to face with truth. We need to meet truth right in the face this morning. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes to the Father but by me. Listen to me. They didn't invite Jesus into their hearts. So many of us have misunderstood this concept. We're going to invite Jesus into our hearts so Jesus will do what we want Jesus to do, and that's not the invitation. I'm going to invite you, into, invite you into my mess, Jesus, to get me out of this situation. I'm going to invite you to do what I want you to do. That was never the invitation, and it never will be the invitation. The invitation is for you to come follow him. That's the only invitation given. Now, I understand, invite Jesus into your heart. It means, it means to the disciple that I'm going to follow you with everything that I have. I'm going to follow you with everything I have. But to a Christian, it's nothing more than banking on a once saved, always saved ideology that's going to cost you and your eternity, and it's going to be spent in hell. They had a face-to-face reality with the truth, a face-to-face encounter with the truth. I believe the second thing that happened this, in this room that, that particular day is they understood, they truly understood what it meant to be a disciple. And I hope and pray this morning that through this message that some of you in this room, somebody watching online can understand there is a difference between somebody who calls himself Christian that just wears a label than somebody who is really a learner and a follower of Christ. There's a difference. Well, Pastor, all I got to do is have a little faith. That's all I got to do is, is believe in Jesus. That's all I got to do. Right, repeat it after the pastor. He said, if you want to not go to hell, repeat after me. You believe in God, you do well. whoop de do. Even the demons believe. Even the demons believe. So what separates the people who go to hell and who don't? Jesus said there's a broad way. There's a broad way. And there's a very narrow way that leads to everlasting life. And only a few people find it. Why did Jesus say that? 
It's certainly not the, the ideology or the religiosity that we have in America today with this American Christianity where you just repeat after me and you're in. Jesus would have never said that. He would have said, oh, if you just think about me sometime, you know everybody gets in. If you just read your Bible occasionally, hey, look, all you got to do is forgive seven times your whole life and you're in. All you got to do is just go to church sometimes, raise your hand occasionally, smile, look at everybody, put your mask on, lie to everybody you come in contact with, tell them that you're really doing okay while you're hurting on the inside. Just lie, lie, lie. As long as you just raise your hand a little bit, you're in. No, he didn't say any of that. He didn't say any of that. He didn't say any of that. He said there is a broad way that leads to destruction, and there is a narrow way, a very narrow way. And then I'm just telling you, I don't know what your definition of a few is, but over here where I reside, definition of a few is just a few. It ain't everybody. And I said last week, everybody can be somebody in the body of Christ. But until you get into the body of Christ, you ain't getting in. You're on a broad way that leads to destruction. What's cool about them understanding what it meant to be a disciple, not only had they grown up and felt the rejection, felt the being left out, felt like not making the cut, felt like not good enough. We don't know if it was their fault, if maybe they weren't intelligent enough. We don't know if the kids they were playing on their playground with distracted them and kept them. I know the Bible says that bad company corrupts good behavior. There may have been the, the people in their playground that just needed to be moved, and they didn't move them, and so they didn't make the cut. But whatever, whatever reason, these men knew the discipleship process. But then listen to this. They also know what Jesus was capable of doing. You think about the miracles that he did. You think about all the things that Jesus did and they got to see him do. What kind of honor would it be to sit at, listen, at age 12? At age 12, they are mesmerized in the synagogues at the knowledge that Jesus has. That he was teaching the teachers at the age of 12. You want to tell me that didn't get around the community? I know they didn't have Facebook back then in that day, but I guarantee you news traveled fast. Have you seen that dude named Jesus? Man, he's 12 years old. He just put the Pharisees and the Sadducees in their place in the synagogue. You should have seen it. What kind of honor would it be to sit at the man's feet who surpassed any rabbi they had ever known? Think about it. They understood what discipleship meant. They knew that it meant work. They knew that to be a disciple it meant to be a learner and to show yourself approved. Listen to me. You may not believe this, and you, and you don't have to. I'm just going to give you Jesus' word. John 15, verses 7 8. Listen to what he says. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. But listen to what he says in verse 8. By this my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit. Listen. And prove. Prove to be my disciple. Pastor, you ain't got to prove nothing. Yes, you do. What have you done to prove that Jesus is on the inside of you? The last thing he said to you was go therefore and make disciples. Baptize them and teach them to do all those things. And we live in a culture today where 90% of the people have never led anybody to Jesus. I want you to think about that. Love lifted me, but what did they do when you lifted you? Nothing. Nothing. Just got my name in glory. David Ginn used to say this all the time. So many people are worried about their four and no more. That can't be who you are if you're a Christian. If you are a disciple. I believe they truly understood and I know that they proved themselves. You know that every one of these disciples were martyred? You know they gave their life for the cause of Christ. They gave their life so that today you could be sitting in a padded chair with an opportunity to receive a salvation that comes that would give you an opportunity to spend all eternity with Jesus Christ and all the saints in heaven. They paved the way for us. 
and it cost them their life. But they were willing to pay it. They understood what it meant to be a disciple. The last thing, and while the praise teams makes their way up, the last thing I want to say to you this morning, I believe Jesus released the fire that had been shut up in their bones in that room. I believe Jesus, in that, mo- in that moment, I believe Jesus released the fire that was shut up in their bones. You know what I wish would happen in this, in this room this morning? I wish the Holy Spirit go on and release the fire that's in some of your bones. How, how, do, we know, how do we know that that fire was released in, in their bones? Well, let's look at the text real quick. Let's look at what it says. They come into that room and they follow Jesus and, and Jesus, they spend the day with them about the 10th hour. As soon as Andrew comes out of the room, what happens? Did you read it? As soon as Andrew comes out of that encounter with Jesus, the first thing he does, that fire that was inside of him, that fire that is burning inside of him, he didn't set or, or go say, well, you know, I need, to pray about, I need to pray about who's going to be my one, or I need to do this, or I need to do that. What he did was come out of that encounter. He came out of that room, and the Bible says the first thing he did was went and got his brother. He went and got his brother. And he brought his brother to Jesus. What would it look like for some of us in the morning if every one of us today, this morning, were to come out of this room and the fire and the power of God that had been shut up in our bones for so long, if that power were to be released in this room and we were to walk out that door and just grab one. Just grab one brother, one sister, one person that's lost. What would it look like? How do we know that fire was released? Andrew proved that it was. He went and found his brother Peter. Do you know that poor old Andrew, wherever you find Andrew in John's gospel, he's only mentioned three times. Poor old Andrew, he's only mentioned three times. But wherever you find Andrew in John's gospel, you know what he's doing? He's bringing somebody to Jesus. Listen to this. He brought his brother to Jesus. He brought the lad with the loaves and the fishes to Jesus. He brought the Greeks in John chapter 20 who wanted to see Jesus. There's no sermons from Andrew. But I'm telling you, he preached a great sermon by his action and his personal ability to want and desire to win souls to Christ. His life was a sermon. He lived it every day. And see, you don't realize today how important one is. Andrew's never mentioned again. After those three, he's not mentioned anymore. But now let's talk about the one. When he fire, when I believe Jesus released that fire in his bones, he didn't know what was going to happen, but he had something in his heart burning inside of him. And I, I love what Jeremiah 29 says. Have you ever read that verse? Have you read it? It says, I will not, if I say I will not mention him or speak anymore in his name, there is in my heart as if were a burning fire shut up in my bones, and I am weary with holding it in. And he says this, and I cannot. What just happened in that room with Jesus, Andrew couldn't keep it in. He went and found his brother Peter. Poor old Andrew's just a no-name, just a nobody, right? But he led Peter, and on the day of Pentecost, how many people got saved? 3,000. A few days after that, how many more? 5,000. See, you don't have any idea this morning. You have no idea this morning what the one person you reach for Christ may accomplish for Christ. You have no idea. You don't have the ability to know that. But what you do have the ability to do is share the gospel and see that that one is converted to Christ. That that one comes to Christ. You have the ability to do that. What would it take this morning for you to prove to be his disciple? See, it's easy today to call yourself Christian. It's easy today to put that label on and just fit the Christian mold. It's easy to say, Pastor John, I'm, I'm, I'm a Christian. I'm a believer. I really am. I'm a Christian. But I look at this a little differently. I think we did lose the context and the clarity of that word Christian in this great freedom that we have in America. 
I think that what should happen and, and should happen today is, see, we, we're trying to bypass the whole discipleship thing. We don't, we don't want that. But I think what should happen is which we come down and we say, you know what, Father? You have, you have said, come follow me. I'm going to choose today to follow you. I've been following the world, and it has led me down a path of destruction. And every one of us in the room have that testimony to some capacity. I chose the world for a while, and it left me flat, busted, and broke. It left me with a void in my life. There's somebody in the room today with an, a crowd this large. There's somebody in the room today. You've got a void in your life. And you've tried to fill it at the bottom of a bottle. You've tried to fill it with a drug. You've tried to fill it with sex. You've tried to fill it with different friends. You've tried to fill that void with everything you can try to fill it with. And today you're just as void as you've ever been. And Jesus is saying to you the same thing today in this house that he said to John and Andrew. What are you seeking? What do you really want? Jesus made it plain when he said, Come unto me, all you that are heavy laden and burdened, and I'll give you rest. He said, Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. See, I think what should happen in, in this world today is we should, we should go back to the process where we understand what it means to be a disciple. That we come and we want to sit as a learner at the feet of Jesus. That we want to come to Jesus first. We want to learn of Him. And once we begin to learn His ways, to know His ways, I'm telling you, that hit me in the heart yesterday with the young man in jail said, I'm telling you it did. I don't have the right to call myself Christ-like because I ain't doing anything Christ did. All I'm doing is going to church, and it ain't even remotely what it was in Jesus' day. But I think we should maybe sit at his feet for a while, make a decision if we really, really want this lifestyle or not. And then if we decide we want to learn from him and love him and do his work, and like the word says there in John, abide in him and him abide in us. Then and only then, after we've proven ourselves to be a disciple of Christ, do we really have the right to call ourselves Christian. What the enemy meant for evil back in the day can be for so much good today. But we've really made it so complicated. We've complicated the whole process when all Jesus wanted us to do was come and see. Come and see. Come and see who I am. Come and learn of me. Come and sit with me and let me teach you. Let me show you my ways and let my ways become your ways. I've showed you how to go get people. Now go get people. Compel them to come to my house that it would be filled. Share the greatest news that's ever been known to mankind, the, the gospel, the love of Jesus. And so today, are you a disciple? Are you a disciple or you just got a, you just got a label on? I'm just going to label myself as Christian, but I'll not give any more or go any further than where I am. Listen to me, that's a scary place to be today. That's a scary place to be. I want to invite you this morning. I want to, I want to invite you to a place of repentance. I want to invite you to a place where you can come and say, God, I missed it. I thought when I repeated after the pastor, that was all there was to this thing. Maybe you were tricked like so many. Maybe you were just handed a Bible and somebody patted you on the back and said, hey, good luck. Everything about life is right here in these pages. You know, it's going to tell you everything. That's not true. It doesn't tell you who to marry. It doesn't tell you what to name your kids. It doesn't tell you where to work. It doesn't tell you what church to go to. It doesn't tell you so much, but what it promises is that there's a Holy Spirit that will lead you 
into all things. But you've got to know his voice. You've got to know his voice. And so today, maybe you've just missed it. Maybe you're like many others. You just, you just missed it. I thought that's all there was to it. Today you have an opportunity to have an encounter in this room with Jesus. What are you seeking? Because I believe he's saying to somebody, come and see because things can be different. Things should be different in your life than what they are. I mean, Jesus paid it all and all to him we owe. So let, let that, just for a moment, let, let that resonate. What do, what do you think, what pops in your mind when I ask this question? What's the Holy Spirit saying to you? What's he saying to you? Is he saying everything's all right, man? You are good right where you are. You're headed to heaven and you're doing a great job. Or is he saying to you, you've missed it? A follower of Christ, a learner of Christ, is a disciple of Christ. 281 times to three. A disciple of Christ, a learner of Christ. Who do you want to be this morning? Do you want to be a disciple that reaches people for Christ, for the cause of Christ? Or do you just want to wear a label like the rest of the world? It's a big challenge. Maybe some of you haven't been able to reach one because you're not one yourself. You have no desire to reach one because you have no desire to be one. that's you today, man, I'm begging you. I am begging you. Don't leave this place this morning without surrendering your heart to His Lordship. To choosing to become a disciple of Jesus. Just table that word Christian over here for just a little bit and make a decision today to become a disciple of Jesus. It'll change your life. I promise you it will. We're about to have a baptism. We're going to sing a song and give a time of invitation, and we're going to have a, a baptism service, and I encourage you and invite you to stay here for that. But before we do this baptism, for those who have made the decision to become a disciple, a follower of Christ, before we get to them, this part of the service is all about you. It's an opportunity for you. And maybe you have been that Christian. Maybe you say, I, I know I'm saved, Pastor. I know I am. That's why I said repentance. Because we need to repent for what we haven't been doing. And repentance is not, God, I'm sorry. Repentance is a turning in another direction and going toward Christ. I don't care what your past looks like. I don't care how wrecked it's been. This was your past. Repentance is, God, I'm sorry, and I am not going back to that old man, and I'm going to turn, and I'm going to press into you. I'm going to become a disciple of Jesus. Disciples will do what Jesus does. Let's pray. Father, I love you. I thank you for an opportunity, Lord, as we talk about the seriousness and the lostness that we're experiencing in our communities. 168,000 people within reach of this campus are unchurched and unreached for Christ. God, I know you have commissioned us all. Jesus, you plainly commissioned us with a great commission. You modeled it for us. You've told us the truth. Holy Spirit, I'm asking you in this moment, we've already seen one saved in the service. Lord, I, I'm, I'm asking the Holy Spirit in this moment to reveal the truth. Let us have a face-to-face -face encounter with truth in this moment. 
What is the truth about our relationship with you, Jesus? In order for us to be that catalyst to reach this community for a spiritual awakening to happen, we have to become one with you. We have to become one before we reach one. God, and for those in this room who have never shared their faith and they know it, I pray that today would be a day of repentance for them as well. That today we would repent for not doing what you've commissioned us to do, what you've equipped us to do, called us to do. You've told us that even as the least of anything, the least of these, that we have the ability to be greater than even John the Baptist. And so, Father, I'm asking you for that help today. I'm asking you, Holy Spirit, to help us to realize that today, that we can be your hands, your feet, your voice. Change somebody's life right here in this time of invitation. And we'll give you the glory, Jesus. It's in your name I pray. Amen.